Schneider. Oh, but there it goes. Good morning. We're going to start our Roman study. So let's do this. Uh, before we start, we're going to pray, and then we'll do a short review, and then we'll pick up really in verse 23 of Romans chapter 1. So let's pray. Father, we thank you again for our time together in your word, that as we're educated in the issues of your wrath, we will understand that all men are deserving of wrath, and you have made yourself known so that men are without excuse. And we just thank you for your truth that we have received, that you have made known to us, specifically the gospel of Christ that has provided for our justification and our sanctification and ultimately our exaltation. So we thank you for all these things, Father. Amen. Okay, just a real brief review. We're not going to do this every week, but we'll review right now. The first 17 verses of Romans chapter 1 is our orientation. Basically, God has provided in capsule form everything that we need for this present dispensation of Gentile grace. He loves us. He's for us. He's provided a redeemer for us, for us Gentiles. When we get to Romans chapter 1, verse 18, we begin our education as saints. And even though this application seems to be more towards the lost, how God is going to judge the lost, those that reject the word of God, we as saints need to be educated in this doctrine so that we understand that God is just. Men are without excuse. He's not giving them something they don't deserve. Uh, so we need to be educated in these doctrines so that we can answer men, so that we can teach men these things. Uh, Romans Verse Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, lays out the doctrine that all men are deserving of wrath. Let's read verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. This tells us not just that men deserve wrath, but why they deserve it. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. They don't believe it. They cast it aside. They blaspheme it. They teach others not to believe it. They're holding this truth of God being the creator and knowing there's a creator and the God of the Bible is the creator. They hold this in unrighteousness. And God then begins to lay out that he's made himself known. He isn't just casting judgment upon people arbitrarily. He's made himself known. Verses 19 and 20 talk about the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. That has to do with, we know some things about God by seeing creation. But there's an additional component about this that we need to understand. Let's turn back to Psalm chapter 19. Hold your place there in Romans and turn back to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm 19 talks about creation and what men know because of creation. So let's, uh, let's read Psalm 19, starting at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor knowledge where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone, gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. And them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Psalm 19 talks about creation and about how um, it uttereth speech. The speech it's uttering is there's a creator. There's a creator who is infinite in power and knowledge. He knows all things. And yet we know at some point in time, God began to manifest his word to man. So there's an additional testimony. Well, that's what Psalm 19 verse seven begins to tell us. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, 
enlightening the eyes. And that last part of verse 8 is very significant. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The eyes are enlightened when we hear the word of God, when we see the word of God. So that men not only are without excuse because of creation, but then the word of God began to be manifested. And we're not going to talk about what happened before the word of God, if the heavens declared more of the glory. We're not going to get into that because that's not the issue right now in our study. But we know that God has this, this additional testimony of the word of God going forth. And he began to do that, not just from Adam, uh, I'm sorry, not just from Moses onward, but he had different men at different times manifesting this. Noah, Abraham. This was before the word of God began to be written down. The word of God was speaking, speaking to men and men to the world. So we know that there's this additional testimony of the creator. Well, verses 21 through 23 begin to tell us how men respond. It says that they knew God. That doesn't mean they knew him as their redeemer. It means they knew him that he's the creator. And, but it says in verse 21, neither were thankful. I'm sorry, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. When it says they glorified him not as God, it's saying they didn't believe him as the creator, as their redeemer. And they weren't thankful for all that he'd given them. When men aren't thankful, they're not going to respond to something. They didn't respond to God because they didn't attribute these things to God, the creation and his redemption. So because of these things, because they rejected some knowledge that God wanted to put in their mind and in their heart, they began to pull in other things into their mind and into their heart. And what they began to pull in is the wisdom of this world. Well, hold your place there and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We just want to read really one verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Deborah, could you read that verse? <clears throat> where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Okay, so God has been making himself known, but when Satan tempted Adam and Eve to sin, and Satan became in essence, the monarch of the planet, he began to put in place the wisdom of this world. He began to be the God of this world, the prince of this world. And we see in Genesis chapter four, how we influenced Cain. And even when Cain was confronted with God, he still held on to his self-righteousness and he still began to follow this wisdom of this world. So, when men reject, when, when men don't glorify God as God, the creator and the redeemer, and they're not thankful, they begin to fill their mind and their heart with these other doctrines. And the Bible calls it the wisdom of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, we're not going to read that. We just want to reference it. You can read it on your own. God calls it the course of this world. Course. College, coursework. Education, it's an educational system that he began to instruct, construct in Genesis chapter 4, and he began to instruct people in this educational system. And it has, it has certain uh, components that are significant to understand, idolatry, uh, a rejection of the word of God, or uh, changing the word of God, or not believing that all the Bible's true, evolution saying there's no God at all. There's never been a God. It has certain components and milestones that as they head down the way of the evil man, they begin to build into their mind and into their heart. And as a result, the word of God says, they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Vain means worthless, meaningless. The things they're building into their mind, even though they're bits of data, some of the things might be true, but it's vain. It isn't going to produce anything of value to God. 
and their foolish heart was darkened. The things they're believing in are foolish, and it's darkened. It's darkened in relationship to, to God. God is not teaching them. They're being taught by Satan and his plan of evil as they're heading down the way of the evil man. Okay, and again, this is review we're going over. Uh, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. In verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What this is, it's idolatry. They change, they change the glory of God into an image. An image is an idol. They began to worship idols, false worship, um, an alter, alternative way to approach God and to worship God. Um, let's turn back to uh, Genesis chapter 4 one more time. I'm not sure if we read the, uh, in Genesis 4, but we'll turn back there. I guess we didn't read there yet. Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> Uh, starting in verse 4, And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Cain brought of the fruit of his hands. He brought crops. There was no shedding of blood. There was not an animal sacrifice which God required. God had told them these things. This wasn't a surprise to Cain. He just rejected it. This is idolatry. He built up an idol in his mind that I know what is acceptable to God. Okay. Well, let's turn back to Genesis. So they changed the glory of the uncorrupt. Romans. Romans. Go back to Romans. I'm sorry. Let's go back to Romans. Verse 23 again. And they and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, we need to understand why man did this. Man has a spirit and a soul. And God created us to worship him. So there's something in us that wants to worship a God. Not a God, God. But if man doesn't worship the living God, the glory of the uncorruptible God, man is going to worship something else. And man does that. He begins to worship idols. He reduces God to an idol. He begins to worship idols of the nations. And he begins again to continue further down that path of being educated by Satan, the, the, the policy of evil. Okay. Well, let's see um, how God responds. So in verses 21 through 23, we have how men respond to God's revelation. Well, we also know in Scripture that God always responds to things. So in verses 24 through 28, God tells us how he responds. God responds to man's idolatry. God resp responds to man's rejection of him. And this is, this is important to understand because man, God has, I'm sorry, God has given to each man volition, the ability to choose. God didn't create us to be robots. He didn't create the angels that way, and he didn't create man that way. He's, he's created us with the, the ability to choose who we're going to worship, if we're going to believe the gospel, if we're going to follow his wisdom or the wisdom of this world. Well, men begin to follow the false religious system, the wisdom of this world. Verse 24, let's read 24 through 25. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Well, there's a couple of things we want to understand. Here in verse 24, it says, God also gave them up to uncleanness. This isn't just saying they're not taking baths or showers. This isn't just saying that they're not washing their hands. It's saying they're involved in some uncleanness. And what that has to do with is religious service. God is saying, what you're offering me, what you're holding up to me is unacceptable. 
You know, as we look in the scriptures, the scriptures give us great insight to certain words. Let's turn back to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. If you don't know where Haggai is, it's right near the end. It's, it's right before the book of Zechariah and Malachi in the Old Testament. Haggai chapter 2. And the, the message of Haggai is Israel had become, become unclean in his sight. Israel had become unclean. So, Deborah, I want you to read a few verses. If you'd read Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through verse 14. In the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. To where, 15? To 14. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hand, and that which they offer there is unclean. Okay. <clears throat> Haggai is teaching the priest something about the nation. And what he does is he gives an illustration. He gives an illustration about flesh that the priests understand is unclean. If it's touched a dead body, that, that what they're offering is unclean. Then, verse 14, then Haggai answered and said, so is this people. That's unclean, that dead flesh touching some things, what you're offering is unclean because of the dead flesh. So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean. See, they're offering something, and God says, it's unclean. It is totally unacceptable because it's unclean. It's unholy. It's filthy before God. So let's turn back to Romans chapter 1. So when God says, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, God is saying, you don't want to worship me as a living God, even though I've made myself known. I've given you creation. I've given you my word. Go ahead and be involved in your own worship. If that's what you really want, go ahead. He gave them up to do this. And that's what the nations did. And that's what individuals do even today. Even today, that when there are churches almost in every corner, when there are millions and millions of Bibles in the world, people are involved in their own worship. And they worship almost everything. They worship idols. They worship devils. And God says they do it because of the lusts of their heart, verse 24, to, dis to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. What they're doing amongst themselves is, is a dishonor. It's of no value to God. They're, they're dishonoring themselves. There's no honor to it. There's no honor to worshiping idols. There's no honor to being involved in things that are unclean. And verse 25 is a progression. Verse 25 says, who changed the truth of God into a lie. See, as they head down this way of the evil man, they're continually changing things. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Even a lost person might say, well, I, I kind of think the Bible's true. I kind of think they're, you know, you know, Jesus was uh, the son of God. They've never come to faith in what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that he shed his blood as a satisfying sacrifice, a fully satisfying sacrifice. But they might, they might hold on to some things of the Bible. But as they head down this way of the evil man, they begin to put things behind them. They begin to change things 
and they worship the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Well, we want to understand some things when it says the creature. It's not really defined the creature, but there's something that is out there in creation that was an absolute abomination to God. And God kept telling Israel about some things. So we want to go back in the Old Testament, look at a couple passages about, and it doesn't use the word creature, but it talks about some things out there that Israel began to worship. And it made God uh, angry. So the first one is Deuteronomy chapter 4. Hold your place there in Romans 1. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Just looking at the time there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. Let's, uh, let's, let's pick it up a little earlier so we get the context. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no man, I'm sorry, ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. No similitude, that is no form, no, no, uh, nothing to uh, make an idol of. Verse 16, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. That sounds like Romans 1, doesn't it? It's an idol. They start with worshiping man and then a beast and then uh, a winged animal and then a um, and then a creatures like bugs. Well, verse 19 really brings you the progression of unbelieving man and what he will eventually worship. Verse 19, And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations, unto the whole heaven. He's talking to Israel and he says, don't worship idols and don't lift up your eyes to the sun, the moon, or the stars, and the host of heaven. I've given them to the nations. The nations are worshiping them. The nations rejected me. Israel was not to do that. They were not to be involved in idolatry and eventually begin to look out at the heavens. There's a, that's the creature out there. The sun, the moon, the stars, and the host of heaven. And what they're really beginning to worship there is devils. When it says the host of heaven, it's, it's not talking about the elect angels. It's talking about devils, the fallen angels, Satan and his cohorts that are possessing the heavenly places and that have set in place the course of this world, the wisdom of this world. And he said, don't worship idolatry and don't head so far down that path that you begin to worship devils. And God says how he's going to respond if they do this. Uh, verse 21 says, Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over Jordan and that I should not go in unto the good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Well, I'm sorry. That verse does not tell how God responds. That's talking specifically about Moses. Well, let's go to another passage. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about another passage. So 2 Kings chapter 2. Deborah, I'm going to have you read this. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Actually, that's I, that doesn't look right. Um, I must have wrote the reference down wrong. I'm sorry. I 
I was thinking about another passage. But anyway, there's numerous passages in the Old Testament that talk about worshiping the sun, the, the moon, the stars, and the host of heaven. And when they begin to do that, God is going to respond in a certain way. He's going to respond in, in wrath and anger. Because, you know what, you're either worshiping the living God or you're following after Satan. And what they're doing is they're actively following these other gods. What they're doing is Genesis chapter 3, when Satan says, ye shall be as gods. The gods out there in the heavens. The, the, the devils. They're, they're beginning to follow these devils. So, again, let's turn back to Romans chapter 1. I'm sorry, I, I wrote down the wrong reference there. I apologize for that. Um, so God is going to give them up to uncleanness, Romans 1, 24, um, through the lusts of their own hearts. They, they're going to be involved in worship because God puts something within us, in our heart, our spirit, and our soul to worship him. And if that's not there, there's an emptiness in our spirit and soul, and men are going to fill it with something. They're going to fill it with uh, following after idols or devil worship, Okay. And men, they change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Well, again, we see God is, continues to respond to how man reacts and how man continues down this, this path. Verse 26 says, for this cause, this is Romans 1, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did not change, I'm sorry, for even their women did change the natural use under that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. So God has put some things in place, and we call these institutions. The institutions God has put in place are absolutes. A man and a woman. A man is a man and a woman is a woman. A family. Children. He values children. You know, the, the nations, when Israel went into uh, the promised land, the nations were sacrificing their children. They were killing their children, having them pass through the fire. And so God has, God has put in place institutions that he values, that are holy in his sight. And even if a lost person is involved in these institutions and they, they follow them properly, God sees that as, as something that's holy. Then we see the, the, the proper worship. Today we would say the, the church, the local assembly, is an institution God has put in place government so he's put these things in place and what man begins what men what people begin to do is they begin to think improperly about these institutions and verses 26 it's the first institution that god put in place a man and a woman god instructed adam adam was to instruct his wife it has to do with the man being the head of the family the head of the marriage and being the head of the family so God, God determined these things to be so. Well, what man says is, I don't like these institutions God has set in place. I'm going to overturn them. I'm not going to follow them. I'm going to change them. Well, again, these are things that God has set in place based on his word. If you reject the word of God, as you head down that evil way, you begin to follow after other doctrines the wisdom of this world says, well, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to, I'm not going to give an account to God. I don't even think there is a God. And verse 27 says, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. The recompense of their error is God's going to put things back upon them. Their error, they're, they're erroneous in their thinking. They're not following God. They're not responding properly to the, the omnipotent God who created the heavens and that desires that we come to him properly and worship and that we need, we need to be righteous in his sight. And then God says uh, in verse 27, 
which was meat. That's fit. The recompense of their error, which was meat. It's fit. Judgment, something being put back upon them. Judgment, ungodliness, deserving of judgment. It's fit for them. Um, so what we're going to do is, I think what we'll do is we'll stop there. We're stopping a little bit short today. But we want to think about the application of these verses. So we're going to spend we're going to spend some time thinking about application. Well, in Romans chapter one, one of the first things we see is that men are without excuse. So we don't want to ever think God is unfair. God is overly uh, angry. God is doing something that men don't deserve. It says they're without excuse. God has made himself known. He's, he's given man information to be able to respond to him as the living God. So when we think about the, the doctrine in this chapter, all men are deserving of wrath. Men are without excuse. I came up with three things as far as application. The first one is, you know, God is dealing for a long time with ungodliness. And unrighteousness. God is long suffering. He's suffering for a long time. He's forbearing. He's putting off judgment. And you know what? He's good. He's a God of goodness. He has made himself known. He's given, he's given man uh, a message of redemption out of his goodness. He said, you don't have to work for it. I'm going to give it to you. You just need to believe it. It's a qualifier. Salvation is unto all, but upon them that believe. It's, that's a qualifier. Men need to believe the gospel of Christ. That goes back to Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So when it says... It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone. The qualifier is that believeth. You have to believe the gospel of Christ. You have to believe the preaching of the cross. And if you don't, you will experience the wrath of God, judgment. Well, the second, the second application in this doctrine of chapter 1 is all men need justification and redemption. We talked a little bit about that. And when we, we talk about justification and redemption, what we're talking about is the salvation package God wants to give freely to every man. All men need it. God is long-suffering. He's holding it forth. All men need it because there's men are without excuse. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. And when, when man simply trusts Christ as their Savior, in a moment's time, some glorious things happen. Man is translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and God's dear son. He's justified. He's imputed with Christ's righteousness. He has a one at one moment with God. So some miraculous things happen the moment we believe. These are the miracles that are happening today. Translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That is a miraculous occurrence. Okay. Uh, the third application, and again, these intertwine these applications. The third one is we have what men need. We have the gospel of Christ. God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We have the good news. It's not a complicated message. Oh, you can get into a lot of details about what happens to man the moment he believes and what, what he needs to think through when he believes or what he needs to study out. But the moment a person trusts Christ as a Savior, trusts the blood of the cross, that Christ died in his stead, they have imputed righteousness. Okay? So... Again, these are some of the applications. There's more application to this passage. Um, 
And we're going to pick it up next week in verse 28. We're going through these things somewhat uh, fast, but we don't want to get too bogged down. We'll come back and visit some of these things as we study through Romans. Uh, we want to understand that the, the, as the men begin to head down this, this way of the evil man, there's something very sad that happens next. And it's really in verses 28 through 32. These, this is the process of putting God aside, rejecting the word of God, worshiping the creature more than the creator, and rejecting God's institutions. And then something happens that is very sad. And it, it really, it has to do with men having a reprobate mind. And it's verses 28 through 32. So we'll pick up that section next week. So I want to thank you for your patience. And keep uh, your homework for next week actually is Romans 1, 28 through verses 32. Thank you very much.